All right. So we know mental health is a big thing right now. OK, it really is a lot going on with these kids, especially um, with the fact of the covid and and um, uh, lack of treatment that's out there. OK, so um, it's the new considered the new morbidity of children. And these kids are going to have things like developmental behavioral disorders, eating disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, also um, abuse and violence uh, directed um, towards children. And then children tend to direct that towards other children or um, other people. So sometimes even teenagers, they'll direct it towards the elderly and, um, you know, people that they can target and try to take advantage of. So we have um, one in five children that are affected and about 80% of those kids don't receive any kind of services. Um, usually people, children with the cognitive or the mental disorders are gonna be um, treated in the community as an outpatient. Um, sometimes they are hospitalized and usually it's pretty severe when they do. Most of the time they try to send them to outpatients. So we have to be um, aware of promoting the children's health, mental issues, reducing the stigma that's associated with mental health, helping develop and uh, disseminate uh, the scientifically proven prevention and treatment services that are out there, try to improve the assessment and the recognition of the mental health needs of these kids, improve the infrastructure for these children to receive the services and uh, support for the scientifically proven interventions. Also increase access to these kids uh, for coordination and quality of the mental health care services. Uh, train our frontline providers to recognize and manage these mental health issues and educate not only the healthcare providers, but the parents and the caregivers about the scientifically proven preventions and the treatment services, and then monitor and coordinate um, that care along uh, and throughout the community. So failure to receive appropriate treatment can lead to further academic and social difficulties and mental illness manifested in the early years will increase the risk for these adolescents to have emotional issues, to use firearms, to engage in things like rec reckless driving, substance abuse, or <laughs> promiscuous sexual activity. I can't talk tonight. So the National Agenda for Action wants to promote the things that we just talked about, that public awareness, um, the uh, prevention and treatment of services, and so on and so forth. So what kind of factors um, interfere with or influence the child's ability um, or behavior is biological or genetic characteristics, nutrition or lack thereof, physical health, developmental abilities, environmental and family interactions, uh, the child's individual temperament, the parents or the caregiver's response to the child's behavior. Changes that occur with normal growth and development are sometimes a source of stress for kids, and that can cause kids to not act right. So like in school, when they're going into those teenage years, and if they're isolated or bullied or picked on, that can affect the way they behave. It can be very stressful for them. Uh, even when you have a small child and they're hospitalized, that can cause them to regress or to act different in a different behavior than what they normally do. The stress that's placed on the developing neurons can also affect their ability to cope with life later on because they believe it's too much stress is placed on the neurons and it causes the neurons to over respond when we're younger. It'll have lifelong consequences on those parts of the brains. So those child, those children be um, more difficult to cope with certain stressors as they become adults and more likely to develop major uh, depression and things along that line. Or maladaptive behaviors is what your author would call it.
So some things that we do is to um, set limits and we hold the child responsible. So what do we do? We set limits. We tell the child what kind of behaviors that will permit or what we won't permit. And we lay down guide lines and rules for the child and we expect them to follow those guidelines. We'll also let them know up front what the consequences are going to be if they don't follow those guidelines. Um, we don't argue, bargain, or negotiate about the limits set. So what you'll see sometimes is when you go into these places that take care of these kids that have these behavioral issues in the process of trying to get the child to do something, they'll make agreements or they'll um, negotiate with them. Okay. Oh, if you do this, I'll let you have a cigarette. Or if you do this, I'll let you have extra ice cream at lunch or, um, you know, so they're negotiating with the child and you don't want to negotiate or argue with them once the limits are set. And so what these kids do is they're smart. They try to play people against one another. So they'll wait till you leave the room. And if you're the, you know, bad cop, good cop, they'll play you against one another. They'll try to convince you that the other person said they could do this or whatever to try to manipulate the situation. So if you're working with other people, another nurse, another coworker, um, if it's two parents, one thing that you have to teach them is whatever the limits are, they have to stick together. Everybody has to be on the same page. So we need consistent caregivers. We need to establish a daily routine. And you can't have me in the room because you need a low pitch voice and you have to remain calm. All right, uh, re redirect the child's attention when you can. Um, ignore inappropriate behaviors, okay, to a point. And then um, as long as the child's not trying to harm themselves or someone else, praise the child when they do control their behavior or when they achieve something that, it, you know, it's hard for them to achieve and only use restraints when it's absolutely necessary. Restraints don't really get you anywhere and they're only good to use, not when it's convenient for you, but if it's a danger for the patient to harm themselves or somebody else. This sounds so much a fight. Huh? Similar yes, to sight. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it to yeah. Yep. So we have behavioral therapy, which provides a stimulus and a response. And we use um, reinforcement to try to reinforce or reward those positive or those desired uh, behaviors. Play therapy, which is where we use like dolls or drawing or stuff like that. And we watch the children play. And sometimes they'll reenact things that are done with them. This is used a lot with children that or at risk for some sort of abuse. So a lot of times the child will reenact with the doll what was done to them. Um, Cognitive-based therapy, okay, where we try to think that way, change that way of thinking. Okay, so we're trying to change the way the child reacts. Um, there's such a thing as automatic uh, negative patterns that you should have learned in psych, where people have these... Uh, three ways of pessimistic thinking that they tend to think about. So if we can change that pessimistic thinking over to a more positive or um, better thought pattern instead of an automatic negative pattern, then we can cognitively change the way they be act, the way they react and the way they behave to certain stimulus. Uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. These are where we use like group or individual sessions. And we try to te te treat patients that have these chronic suicidal thoughts. Um, patients like uh, borderline personality disorder. And we try to teach people to be responsible for their problems and uh, to better deal with their negative emotions. And then family therapy, where we talk um, about the child's emotional issue, how it affects the family, and how the family can work with the child to come up with more constructive ways and make the family work together as a group better. Then we have group therapy. Uh, this can be done in any sort of clinical setting, a school, a hospital, a treatment center. You know, participants sit together, people talk, uh, they try to role model each other. And sometimes it helps when you see another peer or someone your own age going through something. It sometimes gives you ideas of how to deal with stuff better. Uh, my Lou therapy, this is generally done in a clinical setting. 
okay, or in the um, like the psychiatric hospital setting. So we have this special setting and it's a therapeutic environment and we provide support. And then we try to keep those safe that are at harm to risk for harming themselves or for someone else. Uh, individual therapy where a therapist works directly with the child to try to resolve any conflicts, emotions, or behavioral problems. And that's based totally off of trust and the child's developmental level. And then hypnosis where we use a deep uh, relaxation technique um, with suggested remarks. So they put the um, person to sleep and then they give them suggested remarks and they try to get them to talk while they're in this um, conscious but unconscious state about things that may be bothering them that they may not really be realizing. It might be like in their subconscious brain. And so, you know, doing the hypnosis can sometimes bring out those thoughts and feelings, especially if someone was like, um, maybe molested or um, sexually assaulted by someone like their father or where it's really hard for them to talk about certain things that happened. So we want to definitely um, do a health history. Uh, we want to know about the mom's prenatal care, about her maternal history, any infections, anything like that, that she might have had, any viruses that may affect the child. Any past medical history, including previously diagnosed cognitive or mental health issues, any injuries to the brain, any concussions, um, trauma, you know, car accidents, um, maybe the child got hit by a car or any disease processes that run in the family that might affect the child neurologically. All right. So PKU, um, those kind of things. Any is any issue with meeting developmental milestones? Maybe they didn't um, hit the mark or they were way behind the mark. So you can watch the child play um, or draw, okay? And that can um, sometimes tell you about different cognitive or psychological issues just by what they draw. Because sometimes they'll draw really crazy stuff or sometimes they draw things that really are beyond what they should be drawing as a child of that age or something that's nowhere near what a child that age should be drawing. Things you want to look at, sleep patterns, eating patterns, weight loss or weight gain, uh, behavioral problems in school, uh, any risky behaviors, alterations with friendships or they can't keep friends, they don't have any friends, uh, any changes in the way they participate in activities at school. And then clinical fe features that we would um, look for during the evaluation. So we would do brain imaging and look for any congenital abnormalities, any alterations in the brain tissue. We might do blood or urine toxicology to make sure that they're not abusing drugs or doing something that's causing the behavior um, you know, no overdose, no bizarre behavior, because a lot of the drugs, um, well, it might take you a while to catch up with someone if they're doing like cocaine or speed or something like that. But then if they're doing something like K2, that synthetic marijuana you or PCP, you might see some really be bizarre behavior come out of that person right away. Usually if they're doing cocaine or they're doing methamphetamines, it'll take a little while for that to catch up with them before you start to see the weird or strange behaviors. Um, other things that the child might do, he might be impulsive. He might not be able to sit there and give you any kind of focus when you're talking to him. So that might be an indication. Um, maybe you can't joke with them. When you try to joke, they take it way out of context. They don't have a good attention span. Um, they talk about things that are inappropriate for their age or they engage in unusual motor activities for the age or the cognitive level. And then uh, what other tools can you use? Screening tools that look for things like depression and suicide. With suicide, you always want to find out if they have an actual plan. It's not, they're not going to get scared if you ask them that. They're not going to do anything because you ask them that. They're not more likely to kill themselves. Actually, less likely because if you find out they have a plan and the plan makes sense and it's something that they could really do, you would want to know that because you would want to prevent it. All right. And then check them also for anxiety because anxiety can make people act strange also. 
and then look for physical complaints that might be associated with some sort of physical or sexual abuse. Okay, like, you know, someone at a young age, like 11 or 12 years old, um, complaining of symptoms that are sim symptom similar to like um, some sort of STD or something along that line or cigarette burns, you know, things that are inconsistent. Uh, look at their clothing, see if it's appropriate for the weather. Is it appropriate for their age? Is it appropriate for the setting? Look at their face. Do they respond appropriately? Do they have um, any sort of affect? You know, affect is how they respond. So like if I told you someone died, your normal affect, if it was somebody you really were close to, would be to cry. If you started to laugh, then I would be concerned about your mental stability. Even if it was somebody you really dislike, usually we don't laugh about something like that. Um, does the child make appropriate eye contact with you? Okay, and do they show the appropriate level of consciousness and interest with what's going on in the surrounding? And then their posture, posture can tell a lot. How are they walking? Are they walking slooped over? How's their gait? Um, normally they should be standing up straight, you know, perky in attention. If they're not, you know, or they look disheveled, then you want to think about that. Also, the height and the weight, you know, are they growing within the normal range? Are they really below it or are they really above it? And then there are other things that you can look at, like contusions, cuts, unusual skin marks. Um, and just because they have cuts and burns on their skin, all right, doesn't mean somebody else did it to them. They could have did it to themselves. So you also have to consider that. Sometimes people that have borderline personality will burn themselves with cigarettes. They'll cut themselves. They'll stick needles and stuff in their skin. So they do a lot of different things. As far as lab tests, okay, brain imaging, we would do things like CT scans. The um, toxicology, okay, those kind of things. All right, learning disabilities, children dys with dyslexia, they will have difficulty with reading and spelling. Remember, everything looks backwards to them. So sometimes they're, um, you know, classified as being stupid or whatever, and it's not. It's just that they can't see it the way we see it. So usually once they get some help with that, um, that can all change. Children with dyscalculia have problems with math. Maddox and computation. So it's called calculia, like calculus. That will help you remember that. Um, axia, okay. Remember that has to do with dexterity and coordination. Coordination, think about axia, ataxia. Um, it's used in a lot of different statements, right? Axia itself. So dexterity and coordination. And then uh, dysgraphia, difficulty producing the written word. So composition, speech, those kind of things. All right, so sensory processing disorders, these are also called sensory integration dysfunction. And it's a neurological disorder. The child can't organize the sensory input used in the daily living. So they're either hypo, they have a low sensitivity to the input or the sensory input that's given to them or they're hypersensitive to it. And this can result in an overaction to certain textures or the a child's ability to participate in different things. It usually is seen in either preterm or low birth weight infants, okay, as compared to others. And then these children may need occupational or other therapy to increase their ability to function. So in other words, they don't like to be touched like normal people do, all right? Lights cause them more difficulty. Loud noises cause them a problem. They don't want to hear it. So for these kids, um, remedial or compensatory approaches, interventions directed towards any social or emotional problems they may have, uh, remedial approaches to improve their specific skills, uh, compensatory approaches to help them compensate for the disability. So she, social emotional problems can result because these children can have a low self-esteem because they can't do things that other kids their age can do. All right, so they may need supportive interventions and um, coping interventions. 
So you're looking at the health history, family history, any history of learning disabilities, problems during pregnancy, any prenatal alcohol or drug use, pro, uh, low birth weight or premature prolonged head injuries, poor nutritional status, failure to thrive, and lead poisoning can also lead to this. So comprehensive educational evaluation for these kids um, to diagnose the learning disability. And then that can be done by the school, um, an educational team or a clinical psychologist. If the child can't speak in sentences by 30 months of age and does not understand at least 50% of the speech by the time of three and cannot sit for a short story by three to five years old, they cannot tie shoes, cut, button, or hop by the age of five or six, then they should be evaluated for a learning disability. Intellectual disability itself refers to the functional state in which certain limitations in intellectual status and adaptive behavior occur. And it usually happens before the ages of 18. Um, the definition of intellectual is less than 70 to 75 for the IQ test. Um, but the impairments associated with the low IQ um, are around those numbers. Impairments in the adaptive domains of conceptual, social, or practical help determine the severity of the intellectual disability from mild to pro profound. So ways that they can adapt and be able to function on their own would determine if they were considered mild, severe, or profound. So we don't call it mental retardation anymore. We call it intellectual disabilities. So most of them, the exact cause remains unknown. We do look at um, errors, okay, prenatally in the center, central nervous system that may cause them and other um, potential causes are damage or insult to the brain during the prenatal, perinatal or postnatal period. And then um, exposure to alcohol or drugs while mom's pregnant. Um, and any history in the family. So primary goal for these kids is adequate educational experience to allow the child to achieve a level of functioning and self-sufficiency needed for existence in the home, community setting or leisure setting. We need a multidisciplinary approach. If they have a mild um, IQ, okay, between um, 50 and, 50 and, and uh, 70, they'll need academic supports. Uh, they'll have immature social and personal skills, and they'll usually be independent in their ADLs. If they have a moder moderate IQ between um, 35 and 50, then they're going to need more help. All right. They may be independent with self-care and need some moderate supports. Um, impairment will come along um, social cues, judgments, and life decisions. They'll need regular support. If they're severely uh, IQ, then that would be impaired. That would be between 20 and 40. They would understand very little of the written language. They'll need extensive support and they'll usually require ongoing supervision for any activity of daily living. And then uh, profound is less than 20 to 25 on the IQ. And these um, clients will be totally dependent for all activities. All right, they can still understand sometimes the gestures and the emotional cues, and they may even use some sort of expressions of their own. But as far as being able to perform activities of daily living, they're going to need a lot of help. Um, the IEP, that's that individualized educational program. And usually once they start in school, then we develop these um, individualized educational programs. They're usually done yearly. And depending on whether the child, you know, they could be mainstreamed or they could be um, 
in a special educational program. Okay, so when they're first um, diagnosed, you're going to give them lots of educational support. Um, and then they may receive some sort of early intervention program. Some schools offer it like um, a Head Start, okay, where the children as young as three and older can start school in the public school system and they can already have that IEP in place. So we just talked about this. This is the deviation of the IQ. Remember, um, we, if it's less than 70 to 75, depending on what the standard of the test is, um, that would determine an intellectual disability. And then um, once we go 50 to 70, that would be what we talked about with the mild. Um, and then below 70, like the 35 to the 50, that's going to be a little bit more severe and so on and so forth. And as that IQ continues to drop, they become more and more uh, intellectually um, impaired. And it's also going to affect their ability to perform their own daily care. All right. Also, any other deficits that they might have, like adaptive skills, uh, communication, um, health and safety, home living, leisure, self-care, self-direction, social skills, and disabilities occurring before the age of 18. So there's the um, categories, mild 50 to 70, moderate 35 to 50, severe 20 to 35, and then profound less than 20. So, you know, they're gonna need a little help with mild, a little more with the moderate, really um, supervision all the time once they get to that severe level and then uh, they may be able to help with some hand over hand and some cues. And then at Profound, you're doing basically everything for them. They still may be able to communicate, but they're not gonna be able to do most of their activities on their own. So we're doing a uh, developmental screening. Okay, through the IEQ, the IQ testing, we're developing the um, IEPs as needed. Sorry, I lost my page. Get to the page with autism. That's where I was at. Okay, I think I'm there. Okay, so we'll do developmental screening. We'll um, look at the patient's ability to care for themselves. All right, and then um, the most sensitive indicator of that intellectual disability is that delayed uh, language development. They're not able to communicate or they're not able to communicate on a level that's appropriate for their age. So autism, we're gonna talk about now, um, a couple things about autism. like the genetic makeup, the uh, brain abnormalities, the altered chemistry, the virus, and um, toxic chemicals. 
So autism itself is also termed something called pervasive developmental disorder. It usually starts in infancy or early childhood. About one in every 88 children are affected and um, it ranges from mild to severe. The behavior is first noticed in the baby as a developmental delay that occurs sometime between the age of 12 and 36 months where the child regresses or loses a skill that they had previously learned. The parent starts to develop concerns and uh, may contact the doctor or the, you know, the clinic to say, hey, something's going on that's changed with my child. So the exact etiology um, is unknown, okay, but could be due to genetic makeup brain abnormalities and alteration in chemicals in the brain chemistry, uh, a virus or some sort of toxic chemical that mom or the child was exposed to. The child with autism will display those um, impaired social interactions and communications as well as uh, perseverative or stereotypical behaviors. Usually they don't develop any sort of relationship and it's very young. Even at like two and three years old where most kids like to be coddled and um, swaddled and all that stuff. These children don't want to be touched. Um, most of them are intellectually disabled. They require lifelong supervision, um, but some are gifted. There's no medication or treatment available. The goal is for the child to reach the optimal level of functioning within their limitations and the limitations of the autism itself. The child's treatment will be individualized and behavior and communication therapies are very important and where a lot of focus is placed. Uh, these children respond well to a highly structured educational environment. Stimulants can be used if they're hyperactive or we can use sometimes antipsychotic medications if they have repetitive or aggressive behavior. Uh, many of the families use complementary or alternative medical therapy to try to treat the autism. Some use vitamins and nutritional supplements, herbs, restrictive diets, music therapy, and sensory integration. Uh, none, of the therapy, none of these therapies have been scientifically proven to improve it. So warning signs, um, usually the child's not babbling by the age of 12 months old. They're not pointing. They're not using those gestures by 12 months old. They're not engaging in single word use by the time they're 16 months. They're not able to use two word sentences by the time they're 24 months and they're not losing um, and they've lost language or social skills that they previously uh, were able to do or use. Okay, opposition, old defiant disorder, your teenager. All right, excessively arguing with adults, temper tantrums when they're when you take their phone away. Um, active defiance, revenge seeking behaviors. Well, they don't really do that. They just, you know, they're teenagers. Um, frequent resentment or anger, touchiness, easily annoyed, non-compliance with the adult, blaming of others. So oppositional defiant disorder. They're really, these kids are going to be really out of control for the most part. Uh, conduct disorder, they'll be a little more bullying and threatening. They may start fights or there's always fights going on and they're the common cause with those fights. Um, they may use weapons. Usually with these kids, what you'll see is early on, they'll hurt like puppies or small animals at, at a very young age, like six, seven, eight years old. All right, maybe sometimes 11 or 12, but at a very young age, they'll do some sort of harm. Uh, destruction of prop property, they lie, they steal, they don't have any respect for rules. Um, and they may rape their victims as opposed to um, engaging in consensual sex. So for autism screening tools, um, chat checklist for autism in toddlers uh, modified checklist for autism in toddlers the social communication questionnaire and the pervasive developmental disorder testing um, this is the m chat here this is a 
similar one, okay, where you go through and um, you're asking the parents, okay, this stuff about the child. And then you're scoring on this scale there, how the child does. And then there's a video there on autism you can watch. All right, some interventions for autism. So we're definitely providing that emotional support, guidance, and education. Um, we have to think about the child's developmental needs. Uh, the parents, they're gonna have a hard time dealing with these kids. For one, you know, when the kids are young, again, they don't wanna be touched. They're not very touchy. They get annoyed easy. And, you know, that can sometimes make mom feel some kind of way. All right, so you wanna provide her emotional support and uh, make sure she's getting the guidance that she needs, make sure she knows about like the Head Start programs and other programs around that might be able to help her um, to enroll the child. So usually again, they start them at about three with these programs for uh, Head Start and they can get them onto an IEP. These kids are gonna need a rigid um, routine you can't constantly change it. They need structure, all right? And parents are going to need help. So respite care. A lot of them may not want to do it, but there are places out there where they can put the child for a weekend or a week if they need to get away and they need to just take care of themselves. And then positive feedback, okay? Because these children, again, the parents are going to be dealing with them for a, a long time. And depending on how severe the autism is on whether the child will ever actually be able to live independently or not. All right, ADHD, the most common neurodevelopmental disorder for children. It affects about 10% of school age children from four to 17. And it's characterized by inattention, impulsivity, distractibility, hyperactivity. We have some subtypes, hyperactive, impulsive, inattentive and combined. All right, the child has a disruption in the ability to learn in the ability to socialize and in complying with certain demands. Again, um, these children are often misdiagnosed because people look at them as being um, spoiled brats, okay? A lot of times they may have a comorbidity such as oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder, anxiety disorder, depression. Sometimes they'll have developmental disorders or some sort of auditory issue or learning disabilities. The cause of it remains unknown. Um, but they do believe that um, there's uh, alteration in the dopamine and norepinephrine neurotransmitters. And so um, sometimes we'll see the impulsivity, the hyperactivity and inattention begin before seven years old and it can last longer than six months. It tends to impair uh, the family setting. It also can cause interruptions in the school setting. And children and teens that experience the ADHD will sometimes be frustrated. They may have uh, mood swings or moods that are all over the place, emotional outbursts, uh, friends that reject them. They don't do well in school all the time and they tend to have a low self-esteem. They also, uh, a lot of times, have a really hard time organizing, uh, making time management um, and completing projects that they start or breaking that project down into a series of small tasks so they don't become overwhelmed. They're not usually uh, lazy or unmotivated, but they just don't have good organizational skills. So believed to be alteration in the dopamine or epinephrine transmitters usually starts before the age of seven, lasts longer than six months, and they'll be frustrated, mood swings, emotional outbursts, um, rejection by their friends, poor school, and low self-esteem. Again, there's a video if you guys want to watch it. <clears throat> so um, these children, this is for ADHD still, poor metacognitive abilities, can't organize time well, poor time management, the inability to break things down into small projects so they become overwhelmed easily and they don't always get the tasks done. All right, so 
here's some things that they don't do. They make careless mistakes at schoolwork. They don't pay close attention. They don't listen sometimes, and they don't always follow through to complete those tasks. Medication management, um, psychostimulants. Let's see if we can get back to where those meds were. Uh, psychostimulants, non-stimulants like norepinephrine, reuptake inhibitors, uh, alpha agonist, antihypertensin agents. So the psychostimulants will be things like uh, Ritalin, um, Statera. They use that more for adults now because now they're also treating the adults with it. So um, methylphenidate, uh, dextroamphetamine, methylphenidate, and uh, dextroamphetamine. All right, so these help increase the uh, dopamine and the norepinephrine. But the problem with these uh, drugs is their speed. Okay, so they can make the children uh, not be able to sleep. You definitely want to make sure you feed them before you give it to them because um, – if you don't feed them breakfast before you give them the medication, a lot of times they won't eat. They'll just become not hungry anymore. Okay, so you want to think about that. The non-stimulant uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, these are like atomoxetine, and this enhances the norepinephrine activity. For this one, you want to make sure that um, you monitor the height and the weight Okay, it can cause dizziness and you can give it regardless of food. For the um, amphetamines like the methylphenidate, okay, you want to look for things like um, the decreased appetite, the headache, the abdominal pain, the difficulty sleeping. Let the doctor know if it's, it feels like, you know, it's occurring too much or if the patient, if the parents are complaining that, you know, the kid's not sleeping well, they're not eating well. You want to let the doc know and maybe give the parents some advice on how to give it. Like, don't give it too late in the day. Make sure you feed them before you give it. And then the alpha agonist hypertension agents, those would be like clonidine or guanfacine. And these actually inhibit the neurons. Um, and they're used for the ADHD and sometimes for Tourette's syndrome. So it has a sedating effect. So for this one, you have to monitor the blood pressure and the pulse. Watch for the dry mouth, depression, and urinary retention. All right. So these drugs all will help the child pay more attention, make them focus better, and decrease the impulsive behavior. All right. And then we use other things like behavioral therapy, classroom structuring, and this treatment is going to go on at least through adolescence. Some adults are still on these drugs. All right, so psychostimulants help increase the synaptic levels of the dopamine and the norepinephrine. We talked about the riddle, and that's got a short half-life. You're going to give it three times a day. The dextroamphetamine or the dexedrine, and then they have the long-acting dextroamphetamines. Uh, we just talked about the norepinephrine, the non-stimulant norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Those are going to enhance the norepinephrine. So that's the stratera or the atomoxetine. You can take this without regard to food. And this is the one you're going to monitor the weight, the height, the blood pressure, and the heart rate. And it can cause dizziness. And then the alpha agonist hypertensive agents like the clonidine, the catapress, Remember, that's got a sedating effect. So it's going to activate the inhibitory neurons in the brain. All right. And for this one, you're monitoring the blood pressure and the pulse. Remember, clonidine, we also use for other um, patients that have issues with managing their blood pressure. So you're going to have to monitor the blood pressure and the heart rate with these patients. All right, so assessment-wise, okay, you need to find out what kind of issues are they having at school or how are they performing in school. Also, look at things that may have potentiated it, like head trauma, lead exposure, um, things, exposure in the womb, 
Okay, uh, prematurity, low birth weights. Um, family histories of ADHDs. Uh, Self-esteem, okay, because these kids are told that they're bad, they're stupid. Um, also, you need to provide them with emotional support. They may have problems like socially connecting with other people. Uh, work with the family to help, you know, improve the goals and develop the goals. Um, remember, the goals have to be of value or the parents and the family are not going to do it. Help the family advocate for the IH, for the IEP. That's that individualized educational plan. And that should be um, developed for the child yearly. <coughs> Teach the parent how to use different behavioral techniques like setting limits. All right. Timeouts how to use positive reinforcement or rewards, um, not giving in to certain behaviors and not bargaining or arguing. Um, the stimulant medication, again, you're going to teach it to take it in the morning. That is going to help with the insomnia. You're going to take it with food so that they don't get this decrease in appetite. So either with the meal or after it. Okay. Um, Usually these kids have to get, if they're taking it three times a day, they're going to have to get that medication from the school nurse. So that might affect the way they feel. All right. Cause you know, they're not allowed to have the pill at school, um, not in their own um, hands anyway. And then um, you might want to think about a long term. So this way they don't have to take it at school and maybe they could just take it in the morning and not that three times a day or four times a day. But again, it's going to depend on how the child responds to the medication. All right, Tourette's syndrome. Um, this is where the child will have different tics, motor tics. Okay, so what will happen is sometimes they'll just start yelling or screaming out. Uh, they could be anywhere. They really can't control it. Sometimes um, they'll grow into adults that have these same tics. Okay, and then, you know, you might have to interview them or work with them, and they may tell you that, you know, sometimes I have tics and things happen that I can't control. So sometimes they will learn how to try to control them, but I'm not sure how effective that that is. I'm just looking for it. Okay, I got it. <clears throat> okay, so they have these motor tics. It could be one or more, and it usually happens simultaneously. Um, they're, de they're defined as these rapid, recurrent, stereotypical movements or sounds that the child doesn't appear to have any control over. It can affect a few children. Um, usually about 1% to 2%, and it happens usually before the age of 18. Uh, other conditions that can occur with it are ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and they don't know the pathological cause of it, but genetics do seem to play a part. So treatment is going to involve um, pharmacology, psychopharmacology, and behavioral therapies. Also, reversal training in some kids. So we look at the um, history for the occurrence of the tics. The child might be embarrassed or ashamed about them. And the parents may also feel uh, angry or fearful or guilty. Um, look at the child's past health history and any family history of tics. Also, their psychosocial history to determine if uh, the tics interfere with friendship, performance, or self-esteem. Also, look at the child for simple or complex motor tics, vocal tics like sniffling, grunting, clicking, or word utterance may occur. 
the tics can become more noticeable or severe when the child is stressed or less pronounced when they're more focused on activities like watching TV, reading, playing, or a video game. So, you know, sometimes you can help distract the child and engage them in something, and that can reduce the amount of tics. And again, if the child's extra stressed, then the tics might increase for some reason. All right, encourage the family to pursue um, accommodations like allowing for tick breaks, taking untimed tests or tests in another room or um, breaks away from the situation, support the family's decisions related to medication use or therapy and provide education about the drugs and therapies. Um, teaching the Tiger is useful for teachers of the child with Tourette syndrome. It's a book that's out there. All right, so if you're dealing with a lot of children, you might wanna take a look into that book. Okay, so it might be managed with uh, buspirone. This is an anti-anxiety agent. Um, they might use the clonidine, which we talked about earlier. That's the alpha agonist. Um, atypical antipsychotics like respiradone, clozapine, or olanzapan, and uh, tricyclic antidepressants like antitryptyline, uh, desperin, or imipirin, nortriptyline. So you already know with the um, beast prone, what are some things that you got to monitor for that from psych? Boost bar, um, it's not sedation, right? Mm. Well, it might sedate him a little bit, but if it's an anti-anxiety agent, right? But what's one of the other things that you got to watch for with it? Mm. How about seizures? Oh, seizure activity. Yes. And oh, also okay. um, black stools. A lot of times it'll turn people's stools black. OK, um, the a typical antipsychotics. What do you got to watch for with them? And that's sedation, Risperdon. OK, so, so sedation with them. Also with those, sometimes you got to monitor like the white blood cell counts. OK, mm -hmm. for the granulocytosis. Um, what else? So blood sorry. sugars. Blood sugars, right? With the elanzapine, the Zyprexa. You got to watch blood oh, sugars because they can cause um, elevated blood sugars. All right. And then your tricyclic antidepressants. What do you got to watch for with those? Okay. Dizziness. They fall a lot. Okay. Um, it can lower the blood pressure. It can cause suicidal ideations. Mm -hmm. So all those different things, you know, you got to think about with these drugs. So inform the parents about those ticks that they can become more noticeable during times of stress. If we can get them to focus on something, we can sometimes decrease them. We can teach the child about functional behaviors and adaptive skills. And then in the classroom, all right, breaks, um, untimed tests, okay, things that don't produce as much stress or maybe test taking in another room where it's not as stressful for them. And then supporting the family's decision regarding any sort of medications or treatments. Okay, pica, um, this is when they eat non-food stuff. Okay, so it can start as early as two to three year olds, okay? And it usually will happen over a one month period. So they eat things like dirt, clay, and it can progress to things like glass, okay? Some people eat glass, all types of stuff. Um, Rumination, this is an eating disorder that occurs in infants. 
Okay. And it can happen in older patients too. I have older patients that have this and what they do is they regurgitate the food. All right. And the food will come back up either partially or, um, fully digested. Okay. And then they expel it or they swallow it again. And it can put the patient at a high risk for aspiration. Okay. Eating disorders primarily affect adolescents with uh, anorexia, neurose, nervosa, and bulimia being the most common ones. Sometimes younger children can be affected, all right? Um, usually in a household where there's a lot of control or where children don't have much control. It's, anorexia itself is characterized by that dramatic weight loss, the decrease of food intake, and the sharp increase in the physical exercise. Whereas bulimia refers to the cycle of normal food intake followed by binge eating and then purging. Uh, the adolescent with bulimia will remain near normal weight. The complications for these two diseases are the fluid and electrolyte imbalances, the uh, decreases in the blood volume, the risk for cardiac arrhythmias, esophagitis, they can rupture their esophagus, and then they may have uh, teeth enamel problems and loss and menstrual problems. Um, mortality rate for these uh, kids can be as high as 18%. And that's usually because of the electrolyte imbalances, especially with the potassium, it can cause cardiac arrhythmias. So risk factors, okay. Um, family history, female gender, Caucasian, and those that are preoccupied with the way they look, uh, obsessive traits or low self-esteem. A lot of times these kids with the anorexia will have constipation, syncope, um, amenorrhea, abdominal pain, and episodes of cold hands and feet. Usually the parents note the chief complaint as weight loss. Uh, history of depression in the child with bulimia, and then you want to look at the child's um, self-esteem and self-concept. Okay, they may have fear. They may um, have a high need for acceptance. They may have some sort of body image disorder or um, a need for perfectionism. So what will you see in this patient? Constipation, amenorrhea, a catechetic or a wasting appearance severely underweight, dry, sallow skin, soft, sparse body hair, a thin scalp hair. Um, so the hair on top of their head is real thin. Me um, the vital signs, okay, can be out of whack and they might have uh, bradycardia. So a low blood volume usually. With bulimia, you'll see that near or normal weight. Okay, they tend to binge and then throw up. So they may have calluses on the back of their knuckles and split fingernails, and then the mouth and the teeth may be eroded um, from constantly throwing up or red gums or a sore throat from constantly sticking their finger down their throat and throwing up. A major thing for the um, anorexia is the refeeding syndrome. You want to be aware of that, okay? Because they can develop something called refeeding syndrome where um, it will cause them cardiovascular, hematological, and neurological complications, all right? So we do a slow refeeding um, to avoid these complications because the body needs time to um, start taking in these nutrients again, all right? So we have to assess the vital signs frequently for orthostatic hypertension, irregular, decreased pulse, and signs of hypothermia. For the um, bulimic patient, um, we also would want to talk to a nutritionist, okay? And we would want to count the caloric needs and keep um, an appropriate diet. We would aim for a weight gain or goal of 0 0.5 to 2 pounds a week. And we want the child and the family to keep a daily journal of intake. 
um, binging, consumption, and purging behaviors, mood, and exercise. And the journal can also help us assess the patient's progress towards recovery. These um, patients are going to need um, a structured routine. Okay, that includes meals, snacks, and appropriate physical activity. So they may feel the need to exercise before they have any food or immediately after they eat. This is called exercise bulimia. I can have this apple to eat today, but I need to run two miles before I can eat three slices of it. All right, so we're managing it through diet, um, behavioral or group therapies, structured routines, and sometimes they will receive um, psych psychotropic medications, all right, if they're really out of control. All right, we have Cassie, 14 years old, white American, upper middle class kid, parents divorced three years ago, both have high powered jobs, has a boyfriend, 15 years old, lots of phone time, exercises, runs two miles a day, packs a daily lunch, orange juice only for breakfast. She's a last latchkey kid and she was admitted to the hospital and the parents don't understand why. All right, so they're really not paying attention to what is going on with the child. Um, and so, you know, she's probably at that age 15 where she's trying to impress the boyfriend and she's in control of everything or she thinks she's in control of everything. So she's is controlling everything, right? Because she's got the exercise going. She's got complete control over the diet by not eating out at all. And by packing all her lunches and stuff, she can totally control every calorie and every piece of food intake that she actually has for the day. Um, mood disorders. So we have a couple uh, depressive disorders. Uh, bipolar disorder. Okay, it's difficult um, to tell how many kids, okay, um, deal with this because at a younger age, it's hard for us to diagnose. But children can experience major depressive disorder or dysthymic disorder. It's more likely to happen to girls than boys and more likely to happen in the teenage years. Bipolar refers to the condition of alternating manic and depressive episodes, and that affects about two and a half percent of the kids. During the manic episode, the mood will be elevated and the child displays excessive energy. Um, depression can cause alternation, alterations in the school performance and social relationships, and the anxiety disorder and disruptive behavior can occur together with depression. Substance abuse may occur concurrently with depression, divorce, and serious family issues can contribute to the development of the depression uh, because of the stress and the psychological impact. So children and adolescents who experience depressive episodes may harm themselves on purpose, not trying really to kill themselves, but sometimes they're just seeking attention, all right? And they can hit, cut, or burn themselves, and they are at risk for suicide. The uh, norepinephrine and the dopamine will play a role in the mood. Uh, the norepinephrine can affect the energy level. Okay. So um, when both levels are altered, okay, or actually when either one of those levels are altered, the symptoms of depression can result. So we might see things like loss of interest, apathy, lack of pleasure, and decreased levels of serotonin are also um, known to be seen in depression. So here's the pathways, all right, and how they affect the brain. Uh, so we're gonna see some uh, psychotherapy management, all right, to help the child deal with the psychosocial consequences of the behavior and how they interact with other people um, how they deal with crises and how their parents can help them. Parents may also need counseling and these children may need either individual group, family therapy, or all of the above. 
With major depressive disorder, we would have to engage in the pharmacological antidepressants and the bipolar itself may be treated with mood stabilizers like lithium or atypical antipsychotics. All right, so in all these kids, you have to be alert for uh, suicide and preserved suicide behaviors. Risk factors for that suicide are gonna be previous attempts, changes in school performance, um, giving stuff away, okay? A loss of interest in favorite um, things, activities. Uh, all of a sudden they're not hanging out with their friends anymore. They seem hopeless or depressed and they might make statements about harming themselves. They can do it in a variety of ways, okay? They're smart. They can do it in a car, in a garage, with pills, with illegal drugs. Uh, so um, in babies, um, for depression, look for weepiness, withdrawn behavior, or frozen facial expression. Any sadness or expressionless face in a toddler or a preschooler. And then um, for adolescents, especially, you want to look at the entire body. Now, they don't have to be in adolescence. You already see. I'm already seeing on the news. Some of these kids that are killing themselves are eight, nine years old. Okay, so if the depression goes unnoticed um, and untreated, then it puts a client at a high risk for that suicide. Also for other disorders like anxiety, substance abuse, self-harm. Uh, get a full health history. Is there any history in the family of suicide, mental health, you know, bipolar disorder, depression? Because those things can all affect. And remember I said, sometimes when the child's young, they can have changes done to the neurons in those brains that can cause them to present with um, suicide and depression later. Uh, SSRIs, these help um, to increase the serotonin activity in the brain. They're used for depression, OCD, and anxiety. So examples are the fluoxetine, the paroxetine, and the sertaline. So for these, you want to monitor the patient for irritability, insomnia, GI distress, headache, and the blood pressure for increase. If they develop something called serotonin syndrome, okay, they'll get an increase in the blood pressure and other things will happen. And you want to know what that is, okay? That serotonin syndrome. Sometimes they can get this if you give them um, an SSRI or if they're on an SSRI and you're switching them over to another drug and you don't stop taking the other drug like an MAOI inhibitor. So you give that one before waiting a full two weeks before stopping the other one. That can cause that serotonin syndrome. So you wanna be aware of that. That's a life-threatening condition. Um, also with those antipsychotics we talked about earlier, you wanna watch for things with those like Steven Johnson syndrome, neuromalignant syndrome, oligaric crisis. Okay, you should know what all those things are, how they present, and when you want to call 911, because those are almost all 911 situations. All right. A lot of times you can stop the antipsychotic, but you're still going to probably have to send the patient out. With the lithium, you got to watch for toxicity, right? This should be, um, I believe the dose for the lithium is 10 to 20 milligrams, I believe. Um, okay. It's going to help with that anti-mantic um, mood. Um so your patients either going to be really manic when they're on this or they're going to be depressed. And so the lithium helps to stabilize those moods so they're not going back and forth all the time. So it really works on that manic activity so that they're not so hyped up or out of control all the time. Um, it influences the uptake of the serotonin and epinephrine, but it's also a natural salt. So it competes with the salt in your body. And so that's why with lithium, you got to give your patients a lot of food and you have to make sure you eat enough sodium. You don't want to overdo it. Okay. Usually when they give you the um, prescription anyway, they're going to based on what your current sodium level is. So you have to watch the um, sodium and the fluid intake on these patients. Make sure that they're taking in enough fluid, that they're taking in enough sodium and you don't want them to become toxic. If they do become toxic, they'll usually present with things like weakness, um, neurological changes, uh, nausea and vomiting. Um, so this is used for bipolar depression and hyperaggression and side effects are things like polyuria, polydipsia, 
tremors, nausea, weight gain, and diarrhea. So you want to make sure that um, the family knows about the mood disorder and what causes it, okay, so that they understand that it's not the client's fault. And, you know, teach them to talk to the client about not really liking their behavior, that you like them, but you don't really like the way that they're acting right now. Um, because then it doesn't make that so much about them. Teach the family how to give those medications and what side effects um, they have to worry about. What foods can they take or not take with those medications? What other mixes can they mix or not mix with those medications? And how will that person present if they were toxic or if maybe they stop being compliant with the medication? Because a lot of times you'll see that with the bipolar patients, they'll just stop taking the medication. And then the manic periods will start to appear and you'll start to see changes. Um, encourage and praise them when they are doing well, especially when they're engaging in those cognitive behaviors that you like. Remember, with the cognitive behavioral therapy, we're changing out that negative thought process and trying to replace it with a more positive one. And then some of the behavioral therapies where we're rewarding that good behavior and discouraging that bad behavior. Uh, support the family as much as possible and refer them for those local resources. All right, anxiety disorders. Let's see where we're at on the slides because I know you guys probably want to get off of here. Yeah, it's in a way. Okay, so I'm going to leave it up to you. We have like 14 more slides to go through. It's oh, wow. going to take us a good half an hour to go through them if I go through them right. I can read on myself. Which chapter? I can just read the chapter and go over the. So this is chapter 50, and we're stopping at anxiety. Anxiety, yeah. That's the only part we got to go over, right? Yep. yep. It's really literally, we're on slide 67, and the slides go to 74. I think we're on, oh, we're on 64, and the slides go to 78. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> we're literally stopping at page. In your book, it's page 1973 is where I stopped at. Okay. And I'll probably throw something together for you guys anyway, like either early Saturday or early Sunday morning. I got to see because um, I got to see what my schedule looks like, right, to prepare you because I know you guys got Proctor Prep you coming up and I know you got your final coming up. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll try to put something together for this weekend um, to do a review for that stuff, and then I'll try to cover whatever else we can at that point. Okay, so these this is the last little bit of this chapter for the um, um, P. Yeah, I only saw two chapters for tonight. I only saw 49 and 50, so this is that's what we did. So you just okay. got these final chapters, all right? Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you. All right. All so right, as soon as this video is ready and pops up, then, and I actually might just finish the recording out if I get a chance in the morning and just throw up the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Thank All you. right. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, Have a good night. night. See you all tomorrow. Yeah.